Good morning. I hope everybody's doing well. A little bit late this morning. I'm sorry about that. I'm uh, trying to get things organized this morning. Welcome to Turf Rest Epistemology. My name is Travis Shaddix. I'm trying a few new things this morning. So for those of you watching on YouTube and listening wherever you are if you notice anything unusual please let me know i have a few things running in the background uh, trying to test a few things this morning see if they work make my life a little easier if it does work so we'll see what happens this morning uh we have some good stuff today we have an iron article i'm going to go over very short it's only two paper two pages Nice little article on severely iron deficient turf grass. And it's one of the few few articles, in fact, maybe the only article I can, it is the only article I can remember that shows a turf grass response to granular iron sulfate. <clears throat> so it can't happen, but I'm going to explain exactly what's going on with that article and why they saw a response, in my opinion. And, um, exp you know, go through that today. So that'll be a fun one. It's not normal to see what they saw. And so I wanted to go over that article before I get too far down the road. Uh, what else? Went to my daughter's dance recital last night. That was nice. She's uh, moving, I guess, out of whatever she's doing and more into dance now. So maybe that's just the time of her life to do that. So that was fun to do that last night. Um, let's see. I have an error correction from the other day. I mentioned on an, on a podcast, actually, I think the video of the podcast or the live version, the video of the live version was released this morning, I think. And in there, I mentioned the correlation coefficient of 90.3%. Like I mentioned in there, we would be 90% confident that we would see a relationship. That's not accurate. That's not the way that data point is supposed to be read. And I want to clarify that. The R square of 90.3 indicates the amount of variation or the amount of error that the model accounts for. The p-value was, was um, 0.1%, I think it was. Anyway, it, it, the p-value was 0.1%. So I'd be, or was it, oh, the p-value was 1%. I apologize. The, the p-value was 1%. So make a long story short is, we're 99%. When you see an R square of nine, uh, 0.903, and then there's a p value associated with that of 1%, what it means is we're 99% confident that the model accounted for about 90% of the error. We're not 90% confident that it, that it, that there was a relationship. We're 99% confident that there's a relationship. And the model that we used accounts for about 90% of the error. Small little caveat or small little a piece of information you probably don't care about but whenever i notice that i make an error i try to correct it i don't want to put out any information that's not accurate so a little point of point little point i wanted to make make sure that i corrected that so if anybody watched that video and noticed that i mentioned that and realized that that wasn't correct you were correct that wasn't correct <laughs> so i wanted to make sure that was clear I've been receiving a few emails, a lot more con a lot more responses and um, comments on my videos. A couple of emails I've been receiving have been just absolutely fantastic. And what I've decided to do is I'm going to probably go over those. I'm going to have like a comments video on Wednesday night. Anybody that sent me an email personally, I won't identify who those are when I'm going over it. I'll, le I'll leave out any information that it you know might be personal to you or you don't you know, one out there. I won't mention who sent me the email because when you send me an email, I'm, a, I'm assuming that you don't want the information, you know, going out to the masses. So I won't, I won't uh, violate that, that trust, but I do want to use some of the emails I've been receiving as just a point of um, gratitude to you all really for taking the time to send those emails, um, the positive information you've been sending me and, um, at the end of the day, I just want to say thank you for you all sending those emails and encourage more people to, to just express, you know, how they're feeling about the, the, the channel. And I wanted to say thank you for that. So I'll, I'll go over that on Wednesday night. Um, and like I said, I'll leave out any of the 
private information. I won't, I won't identify you or anything like that. So if you left a comment in the video, well, that's different because that's all public information. So I'll go over some of those. There've been a lot of good, a lot of good comments. I really appreciate it. And there's a lot of good chat always. And, um, some people actually take the time to comment on the videos and most of them have been very, very positive. So thank you for that. Good morning, Super TA and Randy and Lush and Brady419. Good morning. Richie the Lawn Guy. Or Rich the Lawn Guy. I don't uh trees down Lush says trees are down ever had to turn around due to one flow. Oh, so that's over in Massachusetts, I guess. Over on the East Coast. Yeah. Yeah, I had some bad weather, I guess, over on the East Coast. And I know Florida was getting hammered a day or two ago. that happens. I moved to Kentucky a few years ago and avoid well, for many reasons, but one thing is to avoiding all the hurricanes and stuff and when it was becoming crazy. I came here and I didn't realize the wind in Kentucky can be quite severe as well. Yeah, I got a haircut. If, if you're saying, if you think the barber, uh, is particularly is blind who cut my hair, it's because the barber actually is blind when he's cutting my hair. Cause I cut my own hair and I can't see when I'm cutting it. <laughs> I'm too lazy to go out and get my hair cut. So I just cut it myself. I hardly have any hair left. So it's like, what the point, what do I care what it looks like? You know, I'm actually waiting. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that it just eventually goes completely bald. So I have to stop worrying about it and have to stop cutting it. But yeah, I got a haircut. Okay. We have an article this morning that is a uh, really just a wonderful article, wonderful article <laughs> to go over a, a web, web, uh, propaganda piece. And I want to go over that to just have some fun with it. There is no author on the paper on this particular propaganda piece. So I won't feel bad about offending anybody. If whoever wrote it, cause I don't know who wrote it. Let's see if I can get it up on there without showing all the other screens here. Oh, I did. I never have figured out how that works. Okay. So this, this website I pulled up, uh, whatever you call it, or a web article, whatever it is, is called iron and turf grass. It was put online. It says here on May 5th, 2021. And it was put on to the Lebanon turf website. And there's no author I've looked and looked. I don't see, I wouldn't give credit to the author. Although he or she may not want it after I go through it, but, um, I wanted to go through this because this Lebanon turf web web, there's several articles in here that are just wonderful examples of propaganda and true information blended with misinformation. And the, the question I always ask myself, a lot, a lot of this, particular, particularly on iron, um, I'm, I'm fairly knowledgeable on iron. I, I mean, I'll kind of have a general understanding of the system. I, I'm not convinced that anybody really understands the system with iron, whether in the soil or in the plant. Uh, I, I've met very few people. Even in the literature, there's only one or two authors who may not even be alive anymore, um, who I really think understood it. I, I, and that's not me. <laughs> so it, it is a very complicated issue. Th there's the redox potential and the changes and the electron donations and acceptance. It just, it's insane, the, the complexity of iron in the soil. So I'll give them, you know, give them that. It, it, I don't know if anybody really understands it, but the, <laughs> this article is not that it's the, the content in it is not particularly difficult to actually go measure. And clearly whoever wrote this hasn't actually measured it. So, and I'm going to show you what I mean from that. So let's get through this it's called iron and turf grass. And we're going to have a scientific article at the end, but iron and turf grass in on Lebanon website right now. It's, and this is a very short one, by the way, I have a much better article on this website if they don't take it down. Um, I won't even mention the title cause I don't want them to take it down that I'm going to go over whenever I get to, ter uh, to fertilizer blending because <laughs> it's propaganda to an extreme I've, I've rarely witnessed. So 
Um, I'm going to go over a better one, but this one we're going over is because we're going over iron. So this is why I went to this one today. Starts off and says iron is considered a micronutrient for turf grass. I, I, I'm not going to quibble over small little errors and typos and things like that. I mean, I can be nitpicky and just be annoying if I want to, but there's no, there's no point in that. But I'm just saying that is it's not considered a micronutrient. It is a micronutrient, but I'm I'm going to, I'm going to do my best to kind of just pass over little stuff like that. Cause I really want to get to the core of it. Iron is a key component of proteins and plant enzymes involved in nitrogen metabolism, plant respiration and chlorophyll synthesis. Due to its role in chlorophyll synthesis process, iron level can impact turf color in many situations. That's true. Iron, iron in the plant, as we saw, uh, what was it yesterday or the last, the last was on Friday or Thursday or Wednesday. <clears throat> the relationship between color and iron that's in the plant is very strong. And I think we even show that today in this article as well. Turf grass will absorb iron via the roots. The iron will be in a stable reacted form. Examples are shown below. Each source has a different iron content and a different availability to the turf via water solubility. So the reason I said that earlier about I kind of have a general grasp of the system earlier, I said that I often wonder how other people are able to decipher what's true out of this stuff. Because I don't think really anybody understands iron in the soil very well. I kind of have a basic idea, sort of. Um, but I imagine, perhaps incorrectly, that the majority of people don't really have much of a clue at all. And it's those people that are out buying the fertilizer a lot of times and spreading the fertilizer. And I often wonder, well, how would they find out? You know, how this is epistemology, right? So how do we know what we know about iron and the soil? How would just an average Joe, you know, read this? Would they read it? as this is true you know or would they read it more critically or skeptically I, I don't i don't know for me i can read these things and for the most part pick out all the flaws and inaccuracies and so forth but it often concerns me that stuff like this propaganda like this is written and i think the majority of the people probably don't probably don't care but probably also don't possess the people who do care probably might not might not possess the necessary knowledge to make informed decisions and we hear this stuff over and over and over again and it eventually becomes or we eventually become convinced that it's true and in fact it may not be true so that, i don't know that concerns me i don't know what i'm going to do with it but anyway i guess that's why this channel exists anyway he shows ferric sulfate ferrous sulfate iron sucrate iron ferric oxide ferrous oxide chelated iron and organically derived iron he shows a list of these products there's a whole bunch of other iron sources as well but for the granular sources those are those are most of them the words ferrous and ferric designated the designate the oxidation state of the iron atom ferrous referring to fe2 which is relatively soluble in water and ferric referring to fe3 which is only somewhat water soluble and only in acidic soil and acidic environments pH of six or less. <clears throat> We're going to get into pH and iron. Iron oxide typically contains both ferric oxide and ferrous oxide. Iron sucrate is iron oxide combined with sugars to reduce staining risk. Discussed later. Now we've discussed that before. <clears throat> that is true. Iron oxide is just iron. I'm sorry. Iron sucrate is iron oxide that's just been crushed, or it's the leftover, you know, rem remnants of iron oxide that they reaggregate with sugars. Chelated iron features iron paired with a chelated agent that can be sprayed, spray applied. It is easily absorbed by the turf. <clears throat> I don't know what his definition of easily is, but we're going to, we're going to discuss this. Organically derived iron refers to the iron present in sources such as biosolids and compost, normally at a very low percentage. Now that's the one source of iron I was never able to actually test because I didn't want to bother trying to balance out everything when you're dealing with or when you're dealing with iron particularly in turf grasses when you're, you just, just just when there's a tremendous amount of organic material and lignin ligands and all sorts of stuff the solubility is 
I can't express it enough. It is immensely complicated. And when you're dealing with an organically derived iron and you're trying to determine whether or not there's going to be a response to that specific form of iron, it's not easy to re remove all the other factors and only look at that. It's very difficult. And, and I just didn't want to mess with it because it was, it became very, very challenging to figure out. I wanted to know, could you actually get a response only from the iron from say mill organite or something? And I never bothered doing that because it's just, it was just too difficult. For turf grass, the generally accepted target range for iron level in soils is 30 to 100 parts per million. That's definitely not true. I'm not convinced that at all that that's true. I should say I'm not convinced that that's true. There is no consensus accepted range for iron on soil tests. So to say this 30 to 100 parts per million is is um, just just being naive or ignorant or I don't know what it is, but that's not accepted by soil scientists, at least not this soil scientist. Turf deficient in iron suffers from chlorosis identified by a pale green co overall color. Usually the reason for chlorosis is that the iron in the soil is not available to the plant, especially in alkaline soil conditions. If the soil pH can be adjusted down to six or so, the iron in the soil will become available and the turf color should gradually improve. Now, if there is one soil scientist that I would say understood iron at least better than anyone I ever am, have been ever aware of. It was Dr. Lindsay who published all these iron papers in the eighties and nineties. And I don't think he would agree with that statement. I can't read his mind, but when you, he's this particular person saying, adjusting the pH down to six, the iron in the soil will become available. I will show you my own research where we did iron. We applied iron sulfate to many soils. One of them as low as 5.1. I think another one was 5.3, which is obviously is below six. And that iron became unavailable within 24 hours. So when you hear things like this, it can kind of sound convincing because you might be indoctrinated into believing that lowering soil pH will somehow result in an increased greening from soluble iron. You may have heard it so many times that now you believe it. When in reality, there's very little evidence to support that. Clearly there's evidence to support the solubility of iron changing as pH goes up or down. I'm, I'm not here to debate that. What I'm talking about in, is in a, in a reality in an applied practical setting in the field. If you're going to reduce the pH from seven or eight down to six or five and a half, you're going to take the time and money to do that because you think it's going to increase the soluble iron in the soil to a point where you'd see a turf response to that. That's not supported by most of the evidence that I'm aware of. And this particular person says, reduce it down to 6.0 and it'll be soluble. And I'm just not convinced that that's true. And I'll show you why I'm not convinced that's true in the coming weeks. Some turf fertilizers have an iron content of one to three from iron oxide. The intention of this formula fertilizer formula feature is to supplement the iron level resident in the soil. I would say that that's probably untrue. I mean, the iron, uh, iron oxide isn't going to, the, the, the solubility of iron is dominated by the insoluble form of iron in the soil by the, by the solid form. I should say it could be not just insoluble. It could be like a amorphous sort of iron. That is the drive, the, the driving sink of iron is pulling all that iron out of solution. That's the driving factor is the solid phase of iron in the soil. That is true. But the intention of the fertilizer formulation containing iron oxide is not that. <laughs> Coming from someone who's blended thousands of tons of fertilizers, I can tell you with a great deal of confidence that the intention of including iron oxide in fertilizer formulation is because iron oxide has the highest percentage of raw material of iron in a raw material, 50 or 55%, depending on where you get it from. And you only have to add a little bit in there to get the fertile, the iron on the fertilizer tag to go from zero to three. So when you're dealing with a, a fairly full ton of fertilizer, you don't, you may only have 50 pounds or hundred pounds left that you can add something into it. Well, you're not going to increase the percent iron in the fertilizer from say, an EDTA or an EDDHA that much, very little. And you're talking on the decimals of percentages when you're going to add it into a ton because the raw material is so low. 
but the raw material of iron oxide is 55% or 58%. It's very, very high. And so you only have to add a little bit to get that percentage to go up in the ton, and that can convince people to buy it. That's, in my opinion, why iron oxide is used in granular fertilizers. It's it's a it's a game of deception. There, the, you know, whether or not the iron actually results in a turf response is not the responsibility or the interest of the blender. They're simply adding that because they they believe that the end user or the end user has asked get my iron up to 3% or 5% or whatever. I want iron in there. Well, they can't do it oftentimes with low analysis raw materials. They have to use high analysis raw materials. And the highest is iron oxide. This is an economic benefit, but the iron content is derived primarily from ferrous oxide. So the soil pH needs to be 6.0 or below to see any effect. So he's implying, he's not even implying, he's stating. He's stating as a matter of fact that the iron oxide in this is not going to be soluble until it gets below six point the soil ph gets below 6.0 it says any visual effects such as a deeper green color will also be minor and slow perhaps several weeks it'll be several weeks <laughs> it will definitely be several weeks before you ever see a turf response to iron oxide that that iron oxide is so st strongly formed i guess that's the practical way of saying it for any practical reason practical purpose any practical definition it's never going to be soluble again for any you know in any meaningful sense to us geologically it will become soluble at some point in the future okay but for us i'm talking about any time between the next six months to the next say 10 years you're not going to see any visual benefit any response to applying iron oxide even if the ph is below 6.0 as long as it's within a, as long as the soil ph remains in the range uh, for adequate plant growth optimal plant growth i mean if you go down to one or very very low ridiculous ph i imagine there'll be some iron become soluble from iron oxide that low but that your turf would be dead by that point anyway so as long as it's you know in the fours or fives where your plant can probably survive still, you're not going to see any appreciable amount of soluble iron from iron oxide. So this is just, this is, again, I'll say I'm not convinced that that's true. And I'm, I'm becoming more and more con convinced that it is not true. So it's a difference. There's a difference between saying I'm not convinced it's true versus saying I'm convinced it's not true. And I'm slowly being convinced that it's not true, which is a much stronger statement than saying I'm not convinced. Anyway, that's, it's not semantics. That's for another conversation in the future, maybe. When applying granular iron compounds to the soil, oh, when applying granular iron compounds to the soil, be aware of the risk of staining on flat surfaces, particularly light colored concrete. If the iron particles are crushed on the concrete by tires, human shoes, or even heavy sweeping, rust colored stains will appear that can be found objectionable and difficult to remove. Now, this is, um, I don't know how to explain this, but I mean, technically it is true, but it's, not true. I mean, it doesn't have to be crushed. Whoever wrote this has never actually gone out and measured and taken the time to determine iron staining from these iron from these iron sources because you don't need to crush these particles. All it has to do is remain on the surface if it's soluble and water to come in contact with it and it'll dissolve and stain within it depends, but you know within five to 20 minutes you're going to see a red or brown stain on the concrete from something like iron sulfate you don't need to crush it iron products based on oxide or sulfate are known for this undesired property now i've done a lot of staining work with iron products which i'm about to show you on the very next uh the very next slide where i've never seen a, a staining from iron oxide ever and I don't think it can really occur because the staining itself is a chemical stain that is the result of the oxidation of the iron on the surface of the concrete or paver or whatever. And in the case of iron oxide, the iron's already been oxidized. There is no more iron to oxidize. So from iron sulfate, it's soluble. And so when the iron comes in contact with the dissolved oxygen in the water, it'll oxidize out. And when that happens on the concrete surface, it'll, it'll form that red or brown stain. But iron oxide will not stain. 
as far as I'm aware. I've never seen it stain. I'll show you a slide in a second that showed it didn't stain. Um, so who, again, I just don't think the person who wrote this knows what they're talking about. Particles landing on susceptible surfaces should be lightly swept or blown into the turf. Iron sucrate can be used as an alternative to reduce the risk, but particles should be still be removed. Iron sucrate does reduce the risk of staining, but there's no known response to turf grass from that from that product, so it's kind of useless. So you know, I don't again, I don't really fault the person who wrote this for not understanding iron. I don't understand iron to be frank. I mean, I don't know if anybody does, but. When you're talking about staining and stuff, that stuff's easy to measure. All you got to do is go out and put out some iron sulfate particles on your curb and sprinkle a little water. Don't don't use bottled water. You got to use water that has some dissolved oxygen in it. But when you put a little water on there, it'll stain in about five or ten minutes. It's not complicated. Do it next to oxide, and you'll see this. You'll see nothing happen. And here's what I mean by that. This is a, a project that I did years and years ago. In fact, let's see when it was. Nine years ago. So nine years ago, I was working for a fertilizer company and I did this little project at my house in Gainesville and I took all the iron uh, granular products that we had available through the uh, blending plant, as well as manganese and magnesium products. And I put them all on one paver to get one shot of them all at the same time. So let me explain. I'm not going to play this video because I don't like listening to myself on this video. This video has me in it and I don't want to listen to it. <laughs> so anyway, <clears throat> I used all the iron, really all the iron, manganese, magnesium options that we had available in the blending facility. And I want to sh walk through that with you here. So we're all on the same page of knowing what's going to happen or what can happen from the application of iron products on concrete. Because the idea of oxides can stain is out there. The idea that chelates won't stain is out there. Okay. So let's look and see what happened. I'll, just so I set the stage here, what I did was I took a few granules of each of these uh products each of these raw materials so just straight ammonia, uh, iron sulfate just straight iron edta and i put two or three um granules in in this little squares you'll see the numbers on the screen here for those listening i have a paver in front of me and there's little numbers from one to 20 and it's a square paver and in the, the top left hand corner i placed some granules and then i moved to the right of the paver and then i moved down and i put another row of granules and I, I, there's four rows there's four rows and five columns and there's just a few granules that i put in each of the little spots designated by the number and the first number over here in the top left hand corner is a dark red brown stain and that came from iron sulfate the next one over came from polymer coated iron sulfate and you can only see a few little dots where the iron dissolved through there okay so the idea that you can slow release so what this means is for the difference between these two is that you're sure you're not going to see a stain from polymer coated iron sulfate but the oxidation of iron will occur you can see two little dots from the polymer coated iron sulfate the oxidation of iron will still occur once it dissolves through the polymer membrane so it, it can still happen in other words the iron that's going to be released from that is still going to oxidize it's still going to have very little benefit to the turf not just because you're slow releasing it doesn't negate the oxidation process number three is vig iron vig iron is a water treatment residual that they um you they treat uh waste not wastewater it actually it's not a water treatment residual it's a it's a water it is a water treatment residual but not from wastewater it's from like river river water if i remember correctly could be wrong on that someone can correct me and put it in the notes but you see very little staining from that <clears throat> but the staining's still there now let's look at iron chelate polymer coated iron chelate the polymer did not do much at all to this particular chelate this was edta and you see a very dark brown red stain from the iron chelate polymer coat and right next to it is the same chelate that's not polymer coated and you see a red stain dark red brown stain so this concept of this idea that floats around in the in the in the turf grass sphere oh use iron chelates it won't stain well this would indicate that they do stain okay iron sucrate is over here this number six is iron sucrate and you see a grayish sort of haze of a stain over here iron sucrate is iron oxide it's just been crushed so this little gray stain i didn't get a macro or a close-up photo of this but this grayish stain is not a stain it's just the particles have been dispersed it's actually those those gray that gray color is actually the the 
particles of the material itself that that dissolve didn't dissolve it, it it dispersed into the actual concrete porous concrete itself so it's not staining the concrete but it does give it an appearance of grayness and then seven right next to it is iron oxide right here is iron oxide so on that article is saying iron oxide is notorious or well known or whatever for staining well no it's not iron oxide's already been oxidized okay it's not going to stain. It's also not going to provide, and that's the reason it's not going to provide any value to your turf. There's no solubility of the iron in the, in the iron oxide granule to start reacting. There's nothing there. Eight is activated sludge. So here is the, this was, uh, this was not mill organite. This was either Hugh Actonite or the Jacksonville, um, biosolid. I can't remember. But there was no staining from this. It doesn't mean there wasn't any iron being released. Maybe it was being released and it was pre, you know, preventing it from staining or maybe none of it was being released. I don't know. But there was no staining from activated sludge or biosolids. The nine is a frit. Which if you don't know what frits are, frits are just like a, 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 a grouping of oxide mineral or oxide micronutrients and we didn't see any staining from that and then tin is a five in one product that's used in nursery that has all five forms of iron oxide sulfate chelates you know all these things in it and you do see some staining from that so the article we just mentioned about oxide and sulfate sulfate staining sulfates will stain as <laughs> as much as anything they will stain some concrete they'll stain wood They'll stain whatever, light poles, and they'll stain metal, whatever. It will stain, but oxides will not stain. Oxides are useless in, in turf grass management. Agronomically, they're of no value. So don't think, oh, well, I'll use oxide because it won't stain. It won't stain. It also won't provide you any benefit at all. Okay. It's already been oxidized. We need to use that iron before it's been oxidized. <clears throat> Just because we're here, and I'm probably not going to go back to this anytime soon, <clears throat> the manganese and magnesium are uh, on the next two rows manganese oxysulfate is the first number here and we see a light yellow orangish haze of color that's been stained so that's oxysulfate a blend of oxide and sulfates and you see a you know staining there and then right next to it is manganese sulfate so we have manganese sulfate number 12 which is a dark red brown severe stain compared to iron sulfate, which is also a dark red brown severe stain. I could not tell the difference between these two. If you gave me, gave me, gave them to me and you showed me two stains, I had no, I wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the two. One's manganese and one's iron. So if you have manganese sulfate in your fertilizer, it is soluble and it actually will remain soluble a little longer in the soil than, than iron, depending on the pH, but it will stain. It will stain just as much as iron sulfate. Manganese sucrate, so it's the same thing as uh, iron sucrate, nothing, nothing there. You see a dis dispersion of the particles and you see a gray haze. 14 is manganese chelate. So here's chelated manganese and you see a stain. It's not quite dark brown red, but you do see a stain from manganese chelate. And then Nutri Plus was a, was, a, was a nursery material. And then the next, row, the next row down, you see all the magnesium sources, potassium, uh, K-mag, polymer coated K-mag, crop mag, dolomite, fairway grade and dolomite micro grade and you don't really see much saying you might see a tiny bit from dolomite fairway grade maybe but that's not much there so the point is magnesium is not going to oxidize near as readily as the irons or the man manganese and i've mentioned that before in a prior podcast magnesium well, did i say that backwards magnesium will not oxidize like iron and manganese and magnesium remains soluble for prolonged periods of time in the soil it is less affected by ph and we have very little of very little likelihood of seeing a response because it remains soluble in the soil. The soil already has soluble magnesium in it in many cases. So adding more isn't going to help. But when you apply it to concrete, you're not going to see much at all in terms of staining from magnesium. Okay. So I just wanted to mention that while I'm while we're here, I thought it was a good opportunity because we had the Lebanon propaganda piece saying, you know, whatever they wanted to say about iron, it's their website, they say whatever they want to say. And I can take their website and explain to you why you shouldn't believe much of it because lowering the pH to 6.0 is not going to suddenly solubilize iron from iron oxide. I'm going to show, again, I keep saying I'm going to show you. I'm, I'm trying to get chronologically through these papers because there's many more important papers than my papers. But my papers are at the very end. I'm going to show you that. 
where iron, iron oxide and you know sucrate and all these things aren't going to result in much of anything at all and certainly the solubility of of iron even from soluble iron sulfate is doesn't stay around for more than about 24 hours even when the ph is down to 5.0 so iron from iron oxide sure is not going to do that okay so i, I do feel some sympathy or I, mean, I don't know what i feel it's just like when i read these articles it's easy for me to read through there and go oh that's just a bunch of nonsense but i often wonder like well what is the the masses what how do the masses receive that information who might not be knowledgeable on the iron issues i, I don't know but you know we got to figure out some way to get this information and knowledge to you guys so you can make better informed decisions not not be taken advantage of i suppose is my my interest i suppose okay so let's get that that's that let's get into the article for today it's very short <clears throat> before i get there let me see if there's anything interesting in the chat Val valerio Merley. okay hi valerio from florence italy nice i have not been to florence italy i have been to italy once once or twice i think i forget once a couple times i think and um I prefer to get out of Rome. I, I don't like to be around like the big touristy things. I like to go and like go into a house with like a real Italian family and sit down. And I want to know like whether I like it or not is irrelevant, but I want to know like how does a normal Italian family behave and eat and you know, what's their daily routine like? So I've been to Italy, I've been to Rome once and I, I, I preferred it when I got out of Rome and got it more into the, the, the countryside part of Italy. Yeah, my wife is actually Italian. She has an Italian birth certificate. My children are from it, are Italian as well. They're Brazilian, yes, but uh, my wife's dad is, um, well, my wife's dad's Italian, and my my wife has an Italian birth certificate and passport, and so does my son. So we we've been there once or twice. It's nice. Polo Fields in the house. Good to see you, Polo. moaning <laughs> all right guys thanks for being here today all right the article is called the title is correcting iron deficiency of kentucky bluegrass this was published in hort science in 1984 by minner and butler from colorado state university in fort collins which is where my family lives they live just south of the south and east of the university there I haven't been out there in a few years this is a particularly interesting article because one is very short, but you'll be hard pressed to find results like this in the literature anywhere. It is not common to see the results that they saw here, but there's a very specific reason why I'm convinced they saw this. It's not a bad reason. I mean, they did everything correctly as far as I can tell, but the, um, it's important to understand the context of the, of what happened when they put it down or the, the, the iron deficiency state of the turf grass when they started the project. <clears throat> okay, so for those of you joining us or if you're new to the, new to the channel, um, <clears throat> I'll read through the introduction briefly. Uh, I, I won't go through the whole, the whole article. I'll only read some of the highlighted green areas, and we'll go from there. Iron deficiency of turf grass grown on alkaline soils are very common, but very little work has been done on the problem. This was in 1984, don't forget. Haravandi, which we went over this paper, Haravandi paper, indicated that iron chlorosis varied among Kentucky bluegrass cultivars. That was the one that had 25 cultivars and showed very clearly that there was not a relationship between pH, soil pH and soil available iron. It also has been reported that total plant iron and turf grass color positively correlated with chlorophyll content. That is one thing that is consistent in the literature. Is very consistent in the literature the amount of iron that's in the plant is related to the amount of chlorophyll in the plant and that will be related to the color of the turf that much is pretty consistent you'll have r squareds of 0.8 to 0.9 or higher or greater when you're talking about what's in the plant it's what 
when we try to take what's in the plant and correlate it to the soil or correlate it to what we're applying and you know those that's where the relationship takes a dive quickly but once it's in the plant we are convinced or i'm convinced that the iron in the plant does have a direct relationship to the chlorophyll and the color of the plant that much is pretty clear there is little information comparing iron product rates residual effects on turf quality and influence of plant iron on chlorophyll content consequently this research was conducted to gather information on iron fertilization of kentucky bluegrass turf iron treatments were applied to a two-year-old uniform chlor chlorotic as determined by tissue test and ratings pinstar and Fal falking kentucky bluegrass turf on september 5th of 1981. so <clears throat> this was located in fort collins colorado oh here let me finish this the plot area annually displayed iron deficiency symptoms from june to october no nitrogen fertilizers were applied during the study except as indicated so what's important about this study is is that this turf was severely iron deficient it was iron deficient to the point that i adding nitrogen resulted in no response which is exceedingly rare. I would say greater than 99% of the, the time, you're going to see a turf grass response following the application of nitrogen, particularly ammonium sulfate. And they applied ammonium sulfate in this study. We're gonna show that. And they didn't see a response, but they did see a response to iron. So the point is in this preamble here is to set the stage. We're not dealing with a normal turf grass situation where you want a little extra color. We're dealing with a turf that is the growth of the turf is, is severely reduced, not because there's no nitrogen, there is nitrogen, but because the iron is so low, it's holding back the growth rate of the turf. Okay. That's going to become critical. Tissue used, so we're going to go through the materials and methods, and we'll finish up that up. Tissue used for chlorophyll and iron determination was collected on September 22nd, 81, and September 24th, 82. Um, okay, let me go through the rest of the materials and methods, and then I'll come back to the, art, to the, the products they used. Routine soil analysis was done on the composite sample taken from the test area on September 5th, 81. The test area had a pH of 7.7 available iron content of 9.3 parts per million treatment of plots with nitrogen okay that's the results okay so let's go back here to the to the actual products that they use so table one for those listening i'll describe what's going on table one this has all the iron sources they have one two three four five six seven seven uh iron sources and they have a control Okay, so the first iron source is iron EDDHA, and that came from a product called Ferroplex 138, and it had 6% iron in it. Then they had this iron product that I've never used called all iron polyflavonoid. It's called, the brand name, I guess, was called Rayplex with a 9.6% iron. Sequestrin 138, iron EDDHA, so they had two forms of EDDHA or two you know, sources of EDDHA. Then they use DTPA, which is sequestering 330, which is around still today. Then they used iron sulfate as the salt, and then they used ferrous ammonium sulfate. <clears throat> I recently came across something on YouTube where someone said, oh, I discovered ferrous ammonium sulfate. Well, okay, great. I'm glad you discovered it. It's been around for decades. <laughs> okay. We're going to explain today. This is going to go lead back to the other articles I talked about last week about nitrogen and iron and applying iron with nitrogen. And then they had a source of mine tailings that was an acid iron. And it was primarily um, iron sulfate. It was iron sulfate 3. I'm not exactly sure how to describe that other than they probably had a uh, byproduct source or something that had acid uh, mine tailings from some probably a mining facility or something who knows okay then they also applied ammonium sulfate now the rates they used of this okay the method of application let's go to the method application they did first because they don't they don't do a really good job of describing this but in the table they explain it 
The, e, the DTPA, EDDHA, the iron polyflavonoid, and the, ED, the other for, source of EDDHA, they all went out as soluble, okay, spray. They sprayed those out. And they sprayed those out at about four pounds of iron per acre, 4.2 or whatever that ends up being. Okay, so I would expect to see a response at that rate of iron per acre. The, the dry or the granular forms of iron they put out, they did the, the acidic iron, the acid, the mining, mine tailings, the iron, the ferrous iron sulfate, ferrous uh, ammonium sulfate, sorry. And then they did the ferrous sulfate as granulars. And then they did the ammonium sulfate as granular. Okay. The granular forms of iron went out at about 22. Well, let's just do the math. Let me get this right. Did I already remove that? Oh, I didn't. Okay. So the, the math on that is, what was it? 24 kilograms per hectare, which is 21, 21 and a half pounds per acre. So they, the, the iron they put out as a grain was 21 and a half pounds per acre. Then the ammonium sulfate they were applying was roughly a third of a pound of nitrogen. Okay. And then they had a control. So that's the setting. We're in Fort Collins, Colorado. We're dealing with very, very iron deficient Kentucky bluegrass. We have several sources of iron. About four of them are soluble, sprayable, and then four of them are dry. And we're applying the spray grade ones at about four pounds per acre. And we're applying the dry ones at about 21 pounds per acre. All right. So let's look and see what happens. Treatment of plots with nitrogen from ammonium sulfate provided no greening, while all iron treatments substantially increased the greening color of the turf. So let's look at this table two, and you'll see here the control, which had, we received nothing, and right above that, which I've colored in yellow, right above that is the ammonium sulfate. The, the control on September 13th was a two on the color scale. The ammonium sulfate was a two. On September 22nd, it was a 3.5 and a three. And then the next year, so 360 something days later, the control was a 3.7 and the ammonium sulfate was a three. So they applied this one year and they measured the responses and they waited for another year, didn't do anything. And then they measured it again a year later. That's what they did here. So, so to see this, when I see ammonium sulfate applied at about a third of pound per acre and you see nothing happen, particularly if it's ammonium sulfate, there is something else going on there. And it's very uncommon to see turf grass stunted to this degree as a result of deficient iron. But that's what they did because they applied iron up here on the same date, September 13th, they did the ratings. The control and ammonium sulfate were a two, but all the iron sources resulted in a minimum of a six and a maximum of a nine in color. Okay. Even from the draw, from the granular products, they re, they applied iron sulfate and got a six point two from a two. They went from a two to a six point two with granular iron sulfate. That is exceedingly rare to see. I'm going to explain a little bit as to why I'm convinced that happened. Okay, as soon as I get through this, I'm going to go to another article briefly and describe what's going on here because in the past you've heard me say. The chances of seeing a turf grass response to granular iron is essentially zero. It's very, very low. It's particularly iron sulfate that's not protected by chelate. You're, you're almost never going to see a response to that. Well, here's an example of seeing a response to granular iron sulfate. Okay, we, we can't take one paper or two papers or three papers. We have to take as best we can the entire body of evidence. And when we're talking about anything, in this case, we're talking about iron and the entire body of evidence includes at least one paper that showed a response to granular iron sulfate. But this is not a normal turf grass. This is not a turf grass or a lawn that's looking five, six, looks in green. We're applying a little nitrogen, it's looking good, and we apply a little granular iron and make it look better. That's not this. This is a situation where the turf is not acceptable. It's not growing even with nitrogen. Okay, that's critical to understand. So we see the, in the, and on the September 13th rating date, we see the soluble sources being EDDHA, polyflavonoid, and DTPA, all resulting in a color response greater than the granular iron sulfate or the ferrous ammonium sulfate. 
So if you ever apply ferrous ammonium sulfate and you think, oh, I'm going to see a better response using nitrogen, <laughs> it goes back to the other article the other week. We're going to apply iron with nitrogen. We're going to see a better response. Here's a yet another example where ferrous ammonium sulfate or iron applied with nitrogen did not result in any additional double dark greening because it went from a, the ferrous ammonium sulfate, straight up iron sulfate was a 6.2 and ferrous ammonium sulfate was a 6. Uh, a week later, we see ammonium sulfate was a 6.8 and the ferrous ammonium sulfate was a 7.8, which was statistically the same. There was no difference between these two right here. They were, they were the same. And then a year later, the color response, which lasted a year, which is unheard of from iron sulfate, absolutely unheard of from iron sulfate to see a response a year later from 8 to 7.7. .7. So there's no difference between applying iron sulfate or applying iron sulfate with ammonium sulfate. There was no difference. So um, paying more for the ferrous ammonium sulfate is not likely, at least in this case, in this particular study, did not result in any additional benefit to you as the consumer or the applicator. But there's a reason why I think that this response lasted this long. And the same thing happens with other elements. You have to understand that the, this is extraordinary results. It, it's, this is not normal to see a response last a year to applying iron. But the same thing can occur even from other elements. If the turf is so retarded or so the growth rate is so slowed because of a nutrient deficiency, okay, let's take sulfate, for example. If the turf grass isn't growing because there's no sulfur, sulfate, then you apply a source of sulfate, then that sulfate, that turf will continue to grow until it, until it depletes the source of sulfate, until it depletes all that sulfate and then, result, and then returns back to its deficient state. So as long as that's there, it'll keep growing. It's no longer slowing the growth. And in this case, the iron sulfate from that early application Apparently, I don't. The iron sulfate is no probably no longer available in the soil at all. But the iron went into the plant, and perhaps it recycled. Who knows what happened? But the restriction on growth was alleviated by applying the iron sulfate, and that lasted for a year. Okay, it's really unheard of. It's bizarre. Okay, to see that magnitude of a response last that long, but it did. Okay, so you see a response immediately after application on September 13th of 81. You see the response continue on September 22nd of 1981. And then in September of 1982, the only responses that you're seeing, or not the only, but the, the responses that you're seeing primarily from that pro, prolonged time a year later are from the dry granular sources. All these are dry sources, and you're seeing the color response lasts that long, whereas the foliar responses have already been depleted. They've already been exhausted, and there's no longer a response to the foliar application of iron. Okay, so it can happen. You can see a turf grass response to granular iron sulfate. It's just not normal. Okay, so if you have a situation like this on cool season turf grass, on Kentucky bluegrass, and you're applying, you're applying ammonium sulfate, and you're like, nothing's happening. This is not growing. I don't know what's going on. It's, it very likely could be a nutrient deficiency and alleviating that nutrient deficiency may result in a prolonged response. And in this case, from iron lasting a, a year. Okay. Let's continue through here. And then I'm going to go back and explain a little bit as to how that's possible. Okay. The iron materials used in the study were grouped into three categories, chelates, salts, and acid treated mining tailings, which had a pH of 1.9. Chelates and acid-treated mine tailings were used as, at labeled rates. Application rates for the iron salt have, been, have not been reported. Therefore, they were applied at various rates from 0 to 96. Now, in this one, they're only showing the 24 kilograms, which is 20 pounds per, of iron per acre. But they did a, a rate study as well, all the way up to 96, which made about 90 pounds per acre. I'm going to show that. That's what a, uh, a uh, calibration is. That's, I'm going to show you exactly how a calibration study is supposed to be conducted on this paper. <clears throat> All iron treatments in 17 days significantly increased turf greening, which is what I showed. During this period, only iron salts applied at 24 kilograms, 20 pounds per acre, exhibited significantly lower color ratings than the other iron treatments. So that's what I'm talking about. They sh these, these dry granules here, they showed a lower color at the beginning than this foliar 
but they still showed us a response to the control. Iron salts applied at 45, 44, 45 pounds of, of iron per acre had a greening response similar to the chelates and acid mine tailing. So they didn't show that in this particular table. I don't know why they said table two in figure one, but they don't, they don't have the 48 kilograms in there. But they're saying that the 48 resulted in the same as 4.8 from the chelates. So 45 pounds of granular was the same as four pounds from foliar. Grass treated with iron salts and acid mine tailings was significantly darker green than grass treated with chelates after 384 days. So what I mentioned, after a year, the granular was still superior, was, was superior than the foliar. Chelated treated grass was far below established acceptable color levels at, of seven. So the acceptable level was seven and was similar to the control on Sept in September 1982. So a year later, they were unacceptable. Ferrous sulfate treatments were applied at oh, zero... 12, 24, 48, and 96. Okay, so that was the that was the uh, the calibration they did. I'm going to show that. Regression analysis indicated that turf color exhibited a linear response to ferrous ammonium sulfate. Or I'm sorry, to um, iron sulfate. Sorry, up to about 45 pounds per acre. There was no further increase in color beyond this rate. So above 45 pounds per acre of, of granular iron sulfate, they didn't see any additional benefit. Interpolation from Figure One indicates that acceptable color ratings would have been achieved with application rates of about 24 pounds per acre. Significant correlations were found among turf color, leaf, t leaf, leaf total iron, and chlorophyll content 17 days after treatment, but not 384. Okay, so let's look at this calibration. This is the way a calibration is supposed to be conducted. I can't get it all on the screen here, but we're looking at a, a graph here for those listening. Color ratings on the y-axis and ferrous ammonium sulfate rate is on the x-axis. And what he's done is he's drawn a line here at seven. He said, arbitrarily, granted, but that's what you got to do it with turf grass. He said seven's the minimum. So what rate of iron would result in a, in a color rating of seven? And when you run these different rates of iron and you do the color ratings, you can put these, these data points on a graph and you can run a regression and say, okay, what's the equation? Oh, here's the equation right here, regression equation. And you can use this equation to determine what, what, uh, what rate of iron would cross color rating of seven. And he did this and determined that it was around 25, 26 or whatever, he's, whatever the exact number was, I don't remember, 27, 27 kilograms of iron, which would have been about 24, 25 pounds of iron per acre. That's the way you're supposed to do a calibration, okay? You, you see the R squared here is 0 0.9 and 0 0.8. It's all good. It's from a granular application, but so I'm, I'm comfortable with that. The correlation between what's in the plant and what the color is is over here on the right, where we see table three, and we see 0 0.9, 0 0.87, and 0 0.84 between the turf color and chlorophyll, turf color and plant iron, and chlorophyll and plant iron. Very strong relationship between what's in the plant and what chlorophyll is in the plant, or what's iron's in the plant and what you see in the color. Very strong relationship. It, it's very common in the literature to see that. No, no worries there. But I want to explain a little bit as to why it's possible Although it's very rare, it is possible to see a turf grass response to granular iron. But it has to be under, in my opinion, it has to be under a very specific situation, which was what occurred in this paper. Because, let me go back to me, because the, the turf grass was so deficient in iron, it was at a stage or a state that is not common with quote unquote iron deficient turf grass that you normally see. In other words, iron deficient turf grass that you normally would run, come across in a, in a normal settings would respond to the application of iron in terms of color, but they're also responding to nitrogen. In other words, the iron is not so low that it's retarding the growth or it's restricting the growth. In this case, it was severely low. It was the element on, you know, Lie Liebig's law of the minimum. It was the element that was that low. And you know, I don't care what else you add to the system, you're not going to change the growth rate because that element is restricting the growth. When you alleviate that, suddenly the turf takes off. Okay. So how is it that granular iron sulfate, which I've stated is almost never going to result in a turf grass response? How is it that it may result or it did result in a turf grass response here under severely iron deficient bluegrass, whereas it might, it very likely will never result in a turf grass response under non severely iron deficient turf grass. If we go back to this paper that I, the very first paper I ever went over, which I'll probably go over it again, I went over this not live, I did it here in my office 
very first video. It's called The Chemistry of Iron in Soils and Its Availability to Plants. Now, this author, in my opinion, is the only author that I would say probably understand, understood iron. W.L. Lindsay. He, he, if there's anybody who's going to understand iron and soil, it's going to be Lindsay. I'm not, I don't even know if he's still alive anymore or not, but he, he is at the top of the list. And in this paper, which goes over all of his sort of past papers, this was published in 1982 in Journal of Plant Nutrition, kind of went over all of his past papers and summarized the findings. And in this paper down here, a little ways through it, he has a statement in the text of this. And this is a very complex paper, exceedingly difficult to grasp and understand. I've been reading this paper for 15, 20 years, and it's still difficult for me to really, I still pull something out of it usually. And this is an example of that. I pulled this out of, of this paper, which I wouldn't have necessarily thought I would ever use. On page 883, it states, it appears that Fe2 in solution is, or is the solution species of iron that is most likely absorbed, okay? And its concentration determines iron availability to plants. So Fe2, remember Fe2 and Fe3 exist. They're species of iron that exist in the soil, and they exist based upon what the redox potential in the soil pH is. But it appears that Fe2 is what is absorbed by the plant. Thus, reduction plays a very important role in uptake of iron. So reduction is the gain of electrons. So you've gone from Fe2 to Fe, I'm sorry, you've gone from Fe3 to Fe2. That would be a reduced state of iron. That's the reason he's saying reduction plays a very important role because oftentimes it's Fe3 that exists in this in the soil solution. So if we reduce it to Fe2, he's saying that plays a very important role in uptake because he's saying that it looks like Fe2 is what's taken up. The findings of Brown and Ambler in 1973 and Cheney in 1972 that re, oh, the findings that re, Reduction by root exudates is an important mechanism for iron uptake is certainly supporting evidence. So these authors, Brown and Ambler in 73 and Cheney in 1972, published and determined that the, the exudation of root natural chelates, phytosiderophores, is what we refer to them today, plays a tremendously important role in the reduction of that iron around the rhizosphere, around the, the area of the root that is in intimate contact with the soil. A very, very small area, a very, very um, thin layer around the root surface. When the plant exudes these chelates, they play an important role in reducing that iron down to Fe2. Okay? We further found that iron-stressed plants released greater quantities of these reductants to the nutrient media than non-stressed plants. This was Schwab and Lindsay in 1982. Now he was doing work with soybeans. And we were able to show that the redox near stressed plants roots may drop to as low as a redox plus pH of four to seven. I'll go into that in the future if I need to. In this redox range, reductive processes certainly are more important in making iron available to plants. Okay, so let me sum all this up. Oh, I didn't even put that on there. I'm sorry, I didn't have it on there. I apologize. This is what I'm talking about. For those listening, you, you didn't see anything different, but this, for those watching, I was reading this. I can't do five things at once, I'm sorry. This is what I'm talking about. Okay, this, this article right here by Journal of Internal Plant Nutrition, Chemistry of Iron and Soil. So those watching on YouTube, they thought I was crazy because I, I was reading this and I thought it was on screen. But this is, this is where I read this from. Okay, 883, all right? Now, let me summarize that. What they're saying is, is that it's been clearly shown that the natural exudation of chelates or the exudation of natural chelates at the root rhizosphere, at the rhizosphere area, will play a role in reducing the iron down from Fe2, I'm sorry, from Fe3 to Fe2 and maintaining it a little bit more soluble in the Fe2 form. And that, that will be taken up in the plant. And they further found that iron stress plants exude more of that so how does that connect to what we found today in this paper? I'm convinced, maybe not strongly convinced, but I'm convinced that because the turf grass in that paper was severely iron deficient, it's possible, if not probable, that the exudation of natural chelates, phytosiriophores in that setting were to an extent great enough 
to maintain the solubility of iron from iron sulfate. Whereas in most normal settings where the iron, I'm sorry, where the iron stress plant is, is where well, the plant is not that stressed from iron, you're not going to exude that same magnitude of chelates. The plant is not going to exude that much of it compared to when it is stressed. And so you wouldn't necessarily see a response to granular iron sulfate when the turf grass is not severely iron deficient. Okay. I hope that makes sense. I don't, I didn't want to get too complicated, but that paper is exceedingly rare. The findings in that paper are exceedingly unusual and, and rare, but the setting was also rare. That wasn't a quote unquote iron deficient turf. That turf was so severely deficient in iron. The, the color was a two, even when you applied nitrogen. So in that case, you have such a severe deficiency in iron that it's likely that the, the, the roots are exuding a chelate to an extent much greater than when the plant is only moderately deficient in iron or maybe not even deficient in iron. You're just wanting a little extra color. Okay. That's what I got on that. All right. <laughs> so it's a little, a little, probably a little bit more than you were hoping to get to from, from me today. I don't know, but I, I do think that um, it's still very unlikely to ever see any value to applying uh, iron key, iron sulfate, granular iron sulfate. But in this case, if you have a severely iron deficient turf grass, it is possible. All right. I'll be on tomorrow at 10 a.m. as usual. I'll be on Wednesday night at 9 p.m. But that'll be it until Christmas. I'm going to maintain my Wednesday night show throughout the holiday. I won't, it won't change. I'll be on Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern time throughout the next month or two, whatever. Uh, but the remaining Monday, Tuesday, Thursday shows uh, will be, you know, paused after tomorrow. I'll do tomorrow's show and then I'll be on, I'll be on Christmas holiday for two or three weeks, whatever it is when my kids are home. Okay, guys, I really appreciate everybody coming today. I hope it went well. I did something different today and I'm not sure if it was working or not. I'll, I'll, when I hang up here, I guess I'll find out, but Unless there's any questions uh, from anybody in the chat, I'll let you go for today and I will uh, be back tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Eastern time. I hope you found it useful. Be kind. Bye.